<laughs> Hi, I'm Lawrence Mahler up and welcome back to another interview. Today I'm going to be talking to Seattle area bassist Sean Fairchild. Hi, Sean. Hello, Lawrence. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's uh, yeah. just the beginning of the week. I'm getting into it. It's slow, but, but good. The weather's not great, so it's a good day to be doing this sort of thing. Yeah, it's a little, well, I suppose our weather is very similar up here. We're only a few hours north of you, so right. I see you've got, uh, got your gear all set up, uh, and usually we start these things with a lesson. Would you like to show me something about bass playing? Yes, sir. I'm, I don't know if I can actually show you anything, but uh, anything you don't already know. But this is something that I've been liking a lot lately. Um, I'm sure you've seen guitarists and actually even bassists now do some of this uh, sweeping stuff, right? This like pick sweeping arpeggios. Um, that is something that kind of really uh, interests me. And, uh, and to be honest, I'm not very good at it. So I'm, what I'm going to show you is, uh, is kind of my way around it or my way of incorporating uh, that kind of concept with chord tones using hammer-ons and raking. Uh, it's sort of an economy picking uh, mindset, I suppose, to, to get more notes out of fewer actions. Um, I really like the idea of spanning a large degree, a large uh, amount of intervals in a small amount of time. Uh, and that's what I think is really cool about you know the, the, the pick style of pick sweeping. So while I'm still working that out, this is something that I really like to do. And it sounds, I haven't done this yet today, but it sounds like this. And that's a little rough, but um, I'll go through a couple of different, uh, different ones here. So um, there's six major chord voicings that I do this with. Uh, one is just a uh, sort of a vanilla major chord. One is a major seven chord, dominant, minor, minor seven, uh, minor seven flat five, aka half diminished, and full diminished. And what I'm doing here is <clears throat> I'm basically, I'm starting at F sharp on the A string, ninth fret of the A string. And with each of these, the pattern is the same, and the quality of the of the the chord tones changes based on on what chord we're doing. So, with the first three, I'm doing a big hammer on to a major third. So on that same string, I'm going from F sharp to A sharp, big stretch, and then uh, and then just plucking the five and the octave. So. And for me, I like using my middle finger uh, to do this when I'm when I'm doing a big hammer on like that. I, I like to use my middle finger for the for the five and the eight as opposed to my ring finger. But I have students who like to use their ring finger more, so it's whatever you feel comfortable with. So that's the first part. Let's see. I see. I see. You've got your bass ready, so should you I wanna... try it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, super super easy. Um, now. What we're going to do is just the same, the same finger that you pluck that octave with uh, on your right hand. You're just going to take that same finger and rake it back down through the five and the three. So we have... And then I don't alternate again until I hit the one. So in this case, you're dragging your second finger across after the F sharp you're dragging your finger down like that whichever finger plucked the octave yeah. yeah so it's it's a three pluck pattern which is um, worth noting because it's it's kind of um, well it's it's odd it's it's asymmetrical so if you're plucking with two fingers it'll be a different finger that rakes down each time if you're successfully alternating which I don't always successfully do so you mean if you played the arpeggio twice it, you would might you might start with I don't know if I can see my you can see my right hand here but yeah I can see it yeah yep exactly so I'm kind of going to hammer on one, one two, two 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 I'll start with your index one finger. there we go hammer I guess on. you could pull off there as well if you want you could you could yeah uh, yeah you certainly could and that would be an even uh, more economic way of going about it. But the thing that I really like about this is that 
you get six notes out of what I kind of consider to be three actions, at least three right hand actions, three, three plucks. So one, two, three, four, five, six in terms of notes and right hand movements really only one, two, three. And I kind of count the rake as just one, one motion. Yeah, it's, it's efficiency um, using the same finger and dragging across. Exactly. Yeah. So then you can just modify these, uh, uh, these intervals to work with different chords. So if you want to do a major seven instead, just change that octave, drop that down one fret, and it's, the major, it's appropriate for a major seven chord. Drop it again. You got a dominant chord. Now we keep the seven, but drop the three. That gives you the minor seven, and then we can start playing around with the five. Keep out all the uh, keep the three and the seven as is. Flat the five, and that gives you your sort of Locrian mode, um, half diminished uh, minor seven flat five sound, uh, which is really fun to do back and forth with something major that you're doing. So if you're playing, for instance. Uh, let's say in, in G major. Uh, that was a little sloppy, but it's fun to just put in when you're in a major context somewhere. It's actually something that I really like doing is just kind of going between a relative Locrian mode and, and, a, and a major key, an Ionian mode. And then if we take that uh, flat 7 and we drop it one more time, we double flat it, then we get the really cool medley, full diminished yeah. sound, which is nice. fun. So I think it, the whole thing is sort of predicated on the, the third is on the same string. So whether you're playing yeah, that's right. that first one, it'd be... And then, you know, for the minor third. So right. those those two notes are always going to be separate, whether they're etc. Um, right. Those are always across two strings. Yep, that's correct. And uh, you could make this a little bit fancier. I mean, we can add notes to it uh, to to make it a longer phrase. I don't really do that very often, but we could add a two in there, or some kind of, or a nine if we're if we're using the correct chordal terminology, which I always. Sure. Think is a little funny but yeah we could we could just add a two in there we could add other intervals um, what I do a lot if I want to make this it, this is a six note pattern so it naturally has kind of a six eight or waltzy feel about it uh, and there's kind of two ways to play it that I that I use it which is using that waltzy feel or playing across the bar line in a in, in a duple meter in four four time and I really like doing that too but if I want to make it just slightly longer um, so that it works better in 4-4 four, four time. Um, you can add a hammer-on and a pull-off from that top note to the octave, because the only one of these shapes that really uses the octave is the, the very first one we did, which is the, the major voicing. And in the case of that one, uh, you could do a hammer-on and pull-off um, to, the, to the nine. Uh, that's one's hard to do with the pinky. But what I typically will do that with is any of the other voicings. So major seven. Or dominant. Or minor. That sort of that sort of idea. Yeah, that's really cool. Cool. Um, and and it evokes the chord. Uh, I guess you could do this with inversions as well, and and you know move move it up to first, second, third inversion uh, for all long, of them, and keeping that same shape of a third, and then two other strings. Exactly. So yeah, as long as kind you of can got, do a hammer on. Yeah, so you've kind of got a uniform sort of fingerboard to look at and fingering for the right hand that you can just move around to all kinds of chords. So you got it. totally useful. I love it. Cool. Um, you know, and it makes me think of the, the next thing might be expanding the voicing. So instead of, uh, you know, closed position to, to taking the third up. So you might, might, you might lose the hammer on that way. So I, I guess that's part of the reason for, for not maybe doing wide space chords this way. 
That's right. And that, and typically when, when I want to do something like that, in fact, exactly what you just did is my, my favorite tapping pattern. So oh, when, when you get past a certain uh, range of notes, to me, I kind of always go into, into tapping there because it feels more natural. It, it just seems like a more piano-ish, piano-esque sort of way to, uh, to get further apart in terms of intervals. <laughs> So if I want to go above the octave significantly, and, I, and especially if I want to do like a one five eight or one five nine sort of thing, then I then I go into tapping mode. Uh, Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think for our second topic, uh, we were going to talk about kinds of music, and uh, I know you have an original project. Do you want to uh, tell us about that a little bit? I would love to. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I record and, and put out music under the name Combinator. Uh, it actually originally started as a three-piece power trio uh, with two of my very, very good friends, my, be my best friends in the world, um, as part of that group, and, uh, and has progressed uh, to kind of my, uh, the, the stuff that I've always made and now am currently making again, uh, sort of a one-man band uh, electronic production, bass playing, vocals, um, that sort of thing. And it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, it's very strong on progressive elements, but not always progressive rock. So I, I'm really interested in, I'm really interested in the avant-garde, but it's funny because I don't think that for people that listen to my music, I don't think that that necessarily comes across. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't necessarily sound like avant-garde stuff. I think I would like for it to sound that way, but it really just ends up being an interest. Um, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of electronic elements. I'm really interested in the idea of electroacousticism. I really like the mixture of textures of acoustic elements, uh, e e meaning even like electric bass and vocals and things like that. Um, with electronic elements. And one of the things that I like to do in almost every piece is to mix acoustic and electronic drums. And I like the electronic drums to sound as electronic as possible. And cool. so I get like a nice mix of, of textures. Um, but yeah, there's, so there's a lot of that in there. There's a, an overwhelming rock theme because that's kind of where I, where I come from as a, when I was a much younger musician. Uh, and a ton of funk. And then aside from that, I've always been interested in Latin music. I played in a salsa orchestra for a number of years, and I've always been kind of drawn to harmonic minor and Latin sort of sounds. So there's always a tinge of Latin stuff in there too. And uh, yeah, if anybody's interested to hear any of that, it's available on all of the major streaming platforms, Spotify and, and such. Uh, and you can also go to combinator.bandcamp.com uh, to check out the latest releases. Uh, one That's of my cool. latest releases is a song called Juggernaut, which I'm actually really, really proud of. I had, uh, I hired two of my friends that have, um, that I've been playing with in bands in the sort of pro show band circuit for the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and they are just ridiculous monsters of players. And I'm really lucky that I got them to be on this recording. I think it's the best recording that, uh, that well, certainly that I've ever made. And it's got probably the best playing on it from everybody that I've, that I've ever successfully captured. So it's, it's very exciting. It's just a crazy all-out uh, celebration of nuttiness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Sounds good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> when, uh, when you came up as a player, did you, did you have a teacher to show you? Because you're doing a lot of advanced techniques, and, and you're talking sort of about jazz harmony. Um, did you did you go to school to learn some of that stuff, or did you have mentors that showed you some things? Yeah, I, I didn't go to school specifically for this. And in fact, I, I went to the University of Washington, and I started. I wanted to be a music major at first, and quickly decided that I didn't want to be a music major. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of turned off by the hyper academic um, pedagogy and stuff that that sort of surrounds music in college. And at that point, I still wasn't playing professionally, so I was more interested in sort of the, the soul components. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I, it, ironically, now, since, since college, I've really delved much more into that. And of course, being a teacher will, uh, will really help you develop that side of yourself. And, and now I think 
very much that way. So it's actually very ironic. Um, but the first teacher that I had was a guy named James Michael Thomas, and he was really special to me, uh, and even more so special now in, in hindsight. And I think he was, I think he was close to my age now. I'm I'm 39. I think he was somewhere around my age now when I was taking lessons from him as a 13 or 14 year old, and I was really rebellious, and uh, and I just I had a hard time sitting still, and I played bass with a pick, and he was a, he was a, a he was a guitarist for one um, who had had a very successful stage career playing with Ray Charles and a bunch of people. He had done this awesome session stuff, and then ended up in the middle of nowhere in a town called Mill Creek, Washington, which back then was even smaller than it is now. Now it's like practically a, a suburb of Seattle, but it's about 25 miles north of Seattle, and it's where my family relocated to when we, when we moved to Washington. And, uh, and I got hooked up with him, and he was so influential to me. Um, he, he taught me that uh, it was important to be a musician first and a bass player second. And that's one of the things that I try to instill into all of my students because I think it's really, really important for me personally. I'm not satisfied to just be, you know, a bass player. I'm a musician who chooses yeah. to play the bass. Yeah. I really, really like the, the electric bass. I mean, it's, it's the, as Les Claypool says sometimes, it's the crayon that he picked out of the box, but it could have been any crayon. It could have been any color. And, and I came to this by accident. Somebody put a bass in my hands. I didn't even know what, what it was. So I never had that moment where I chose to be a bass player based on an experience, hearing something or something like that. Someone just put a bass in my hands, and it was that was probably the best day of, of my young life. Wow. And the teacher so, was, was, was very influential. So when you first heard the sound, for me, that was the thing. I was a piano kid, mm -hmm. and I played the low notes all the time. I you know, just hit ah, that sustain yeah. pedal and just bang as loud as you could. And when I heard that there was an instrument that made that sound, I was really happy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of power in it, you know. To yeah. be honest, it's yeah. there's uh, there's something primal and uh, and exciting about you know having being responsible for that much gravity and uh, and that much depth. Well, it's interesting. I I remember reading about acoustics, you know, and and when I was doing audio engineering and learning that the ear actually processes low sounds more physically than high sounds. Mm. They're actually physically more fulfilling. So we talk about that, and we all know that. We all know what a big amp behind you feels like. Sure. Um, you know, that, that sense of, um, of vibration and feeling more involved, you know, and that's not to take away from the high-frequency instruments, although they are a lower class. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As we both sit here playing six-string basses. <laughs> yeah, right. We're trying to play higher frequencies. Yeah. So, so do you, you were mentioning teaching. Do you teach online? Are you doing the Zoom thing with everybody now? I do, yeah. I yeah. teach online, and thankfully, I had already gotten into remote teaching uh, years ago, well, well in advance of the the COVID uh, drama of 2020, and yeah. and hopefully not beyond. That might that might sound silly in retrospect in a year or two, but uh, but uh, yeah. So I, I do teach online, um, and I, I regularly teach online. I would say a majority of my students are still online students uh, now, where where I live in. In King County, and that's I live very close to Snohomish County. Uh, it, things are such that I can have in-person students again, uh, which is great. Um, but still, a majority of my of my students are online, uh, and then certainly I've got I've got students in Russia and Australia, and certainly they're always going to be online people. But that's kind of one of the that that's that's one of the huge perks of of having these technologies. Uh, really, the only thing that you miss out on is being able to do anything in real time with each other. Uh, yeah. But I, I, fe I feel like over time I've developed ways uh, that are effective to, to get around that. But I do teach online, and um, if anybody's interested to learn more, if you put my name into your URL search bar, seanfairchild.com, Sean spelled S-E-A-N, uh, you'll find my website, and it's got information there on, uh, on how to get in touch with me uh, about lessons and kind of my lesson methodology. And in fact, you'll hear, you'll read the same story about James Michael Thomas and him telling me to be a musician first and a bass player second. I love it. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, it is an odd time in the world, right? We're all dealing with the, the situation where we're locked down to various degrees or coming back and restrictions and all those kind of things. 
Um, and I've, I've talked to every bass player so far about how do you manage that? How are you, you know, getting through it? Uh, and for me, it's been keeping my health together with running and everybody knows I'm baking apple pies and, you know, the various things that uh, get you through. I'm playing a lot more piano at home these days too. Um, so is there, is there any tips that you might have for people that are watching this about uh, ways of keeping yourself together? Boy, you know, I don't, I, I've actually had a pretty hard time with this whole situation. Yeah. Right? I don't know if I'm actually in, in a position to offer many tips, but I, I will say, I guess a couple of things is that in, in this, in the environment that we find ourselves with, with social media, uh, with Facebook in particular, which has just increasingly become a horrible place to spend time. Uh, but unfortunately, a place where many, many of us who do this sort of thing uh, we really need that outlet to be able to market ourselves and market what we do. There's not a, there's not a good substitute for it yet. Uh, but in this time when we spend a lot of time uh, online, uh, I have found it interesting and also uplifting to, to see that people in reality uh, are less politically polarized, are, are less um, just heavily opinionated on everything under the sun, uh, and, and that for me has been a, a big thing because I actually developed quite a bit of anxiety over the lockdown and, uh, and to be honest, actually did a little bit of online counseling also. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the state of mental health for somebody like me who I, I'm very focused on people and I like to be out in a crowd. I, I'm not at all misanthropic. Uh, I like to be, <laughs> I'm just a big fan of being around folks. And uh, it was hard to be cut off from that, especially, you know, when playing out is, is half of your, your livelihood. Then now yeah. there's a financial aspect, too, that I'm missing out on. Yeah. Um, so just kind of taking all the online vitriol with a grain of salt, I think, has been important. And like you said, I'm, I'm trying to get out and run as much as I can. Normally, I, I do boxing and, and Muay Thai kickboxing. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to, to do those things during this time. Uh, so in lieu of that, I'm trying to run and do some more exercising uh, at home, and the endorphins certainly help. Um, and, but yeah, just kind of uh, reminding myself that um, the Facebook worldview is not necessarily the actual worldview has been important for my mental health. So if anybody yeah. else is feeling stressed out about that stuff, I would, I would recommend you know finding a way to, to realize that or just taking a break from it. Well, and that's it. It's it's all about talking with each other and and being across from someone and sharing a coffee and and missing missing those times. And uh, this is uh, my little replacement for it for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree. Like uh, once you once you're there with somebody, people are so much more civil, and the internet takes away that as as we all know, it takes away that civility in so in too many cases. But I will say, everything that I post on here is the truth. <laughs> because <laughs> that's be, all base can't be argued there you <laughs> that's go that's right <laughs> it's, it's, and so far we've had it's all base I like that. sorry go ahead <laughs> oh i just like that it's the truth because it's all base there you go like, i think maybe like there's yeah, something be... fundamental about it <laughs> I love i'll be it. here all week yeah well we've had everything from bow technique to playing an orchestra to tapping and and effects and you know how to read a nashville number chart mm. uh so it, it's been great to uh to have you aboard for this series uh sean and i'll be posting it really soon so well, thank, thank you so you. much and i want to just close by saying happy birthday to your daughter in about a month uh, all right thank you that's really uh, an exciting time i remember those days well no sleep at all for for years but uh it's uh the exhilaration of it is just wonderful as well so that's true. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate that. And thank you for inviting me on. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Okay. Thanks, Sean.